I'm middle school historian Charles Pittiscom, and today I'm going to take you on a journey into the life of arguably one of the worst generals in the Civil War, George McClellan. From a strategic point of view, George McClellan was the worst general in the Civil War as well as in politics. McClellan was born in Philadelphia in the 1820s. For this city, this was a time of great industrial growth. Like any other northern town, Philadelphia was caught up in the Industrial Revolution. This was the time of McClellan's birth. McClellan was born on December 3, 1826. His father was a well-known surgeon. He lived with his two brothers and sisters. As a child, he was very well educated. After being privately tutored for four years, McClellan enrolled in the prep school University of Philadelphia. He only spent two years there. Because at age 15, he was asked to come to the West Point. This was a great honor because the minimum age requirement was 16. But you know, he was still let in because he was a very smart kid. The first year was hard for the young cadet. Anxiety of the workload and his social inability made school extremely difficult. Although later in his schooling, he became more comfortable and developed strong relationships with his classmates. In 1846, he graduated with flying colors. And by the time of his graduation, war with Mexico seemed imminent, and McClellan was eager to show off his new skills when promotion was on the line. His hometown of Philadelphia felt the same way and backed the president's decision to go to war with Mexico. McClellan's division began a march to Mexico City in 1846. This took a large toll on McClellan mentally and physically. He began the conquest very optimistic, but the lack of confidence in the volunteer soldiers brought his spirits down greatly. Also, the heat and other foreign conditions caused him to spend four weeks in the hospital. His group in Mexico was met with very little resistance. His group was key in the capture of Veracruz, Caragordo, Contreras, and Cerro Bisco. After capturing Molino de Rey, McClellan and his division had to go attack the National Mexican Military Academy, the castle of Chapultec. McClellan's division was to breach the castle from the southwest part. After the fall of Chapultec, McClellan was assigned to a new division. His mission? Attack San Cosme, one of the main gates of Mexico City. After they got through the city, they're just walking along, and BAM! Out of nowhere attacked. And they're like, what's going on? So basically, they took down the Mexicans and kept walking down the street. Later that night, after their victory, they're in their camp and they hear a rumor that the city had been evacuated and the public officials were begging for a surrender. McClellan was sent, on, was sent on a reconnaissance mission. He was to confirm that the rumors were true. Indeed they were. And his division proceeded into the heart of the city. So McClellan and his party went to the heart of the city. They took down any bit of resistance they found. The war with Mexico was over. America had won. And in war's valiant efforts in Mexico, McClellan was awarded first lieutenant of the engineers. After the war, he was sent on various exploration missions in the, into the Pacific Northwest. Also, in 1885, he took a mission to Europe where he studied European warfare. While there, he made a new American saddle. This saddle was a combination of American and European. This model was still used in the U.S. until the cavalry was disbanded in the early 1900s. In 1857, McClellan resigned from the Army, and then he began working at the Illinois Railroad Company an organization represented by Abraham Lincoln back when he was just a lawyer. Then, in 1860, he became the president of the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad. After the Mexican War, he lived a peaceful and simple wife, life with his wife in Philadelphia. But all that changed when war broke out again, and McClellan re-enlisted to help preserve the union. Our cause must never be abandoned. It is the cause of free institutions and self-government. The Constitution and the Union must be preserved, whatever the cost may be, in time, treasure, and blood. July 1862, letter from George McClellan to President Lincoln. He originally had the post of, a, of, of major in the Ohio State Militia, but his command soon expanded. He lost Kentucky to the Confederacy, but soon redeemed himself when he pushed Confederate forces out of West Virginia. He officially took control of the Army of Potomac in 1861. When he was the leader of the Army of Potomac, he made drastic changes. He turned every one of his men into disciplined, well-trained soldiers. 
His men enjoyed his leadership, and soon after, he had his next promotion in sights. Within three and a half months, McClellan replaced General Winfield Scott as Supreme Leader of the Union Army. His speed at which he was promoted was primarily due to his close relationship with President Lincoln. My relationships with Lincoln were generally pleasant. I seldom had trouble with him when we met face to face. I believe that he liked me personally and certainly was always much influenced by me when we were together. During the early part of my command in Washington, he often consulted with me before taking important steps or appointing general officers. Letter to Wife, 1861. During the early parts of his commands, he had much difficulty leading his troops in combat. He was a very cautious person, and his political enemies in Washington saw that he was purposely slowing the Union progress. And by this dis and his criticism, Lincoln decided to relieve him of, of his command. But in, 18, in 1862, President Lincoln called on McClellan again to defend Washington against the forces of Robert E. Lee. This was the Battle of Antium. This was going to be the bloodiest day of the Civil War. And even with discovering Robert E. Lee's secret plans for the war, McClellan still was not able to secure a Union victory. He was just not a good general. After Antium, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and to McClellan, a Democrat, this angered him. He did not approve of this. The Civil War to him was not about slavery. It was about preservation of the Union. And after this incident, he repeatedly refused to listen to President Abraham Lincoln's orders. At one point, McClellan began thinking of President Lincoln as a social inferior. This defiance angered the politicians. McClellan possessed two crippling traits. First, his big head was nothing more of a mask to conceal his wimpiness. When battle started and casualties rose, McClellan proved weak. He actually wrote a letter to President Lincoln saying that he would not put his men in dangerous situations where they could die. His men appreciated it, but it was not how to win a war. Secondly, when he lost in battle, he blamed it on his superiors. Ironically, his, all his, the only victory he ever had was actually because of the skill of his superiors. These traits showed his defeat at the Pennsylvania Campaign in Richmond. He, es he overestimated the size of the enemy, attacked cautiously, then he attacked from the wrong direction when he refused to listen to President Lincoln. He lost a terrible defeat, shame and disgrace. He blamed his loss on the Republican views of Washington. Then, in November 1862, all of his compiled failures finally led President Lincoln to just kick him right out of the army, because he was a bad general. I fear that my day of usefulness to this country is past, at least under this administration. I hope and trust that God will watch over, guide, and protect me. I accept, most resigningly, all he has brought upon me. Perhaps I have really brought it upon myself, for while striving continuously to do my best, it may well have been that I have made great mistakes that my vanity does not permit me to perceive. General George B. McClellan, letter to his wife, July 1862. After he was kicked out of the army, George McClellan became the, ne the Democratic nominee for the presidential race in 1864. He was destined to lose this race. This was because the Democratic Party had split into two separate parties, Peace Democrats and War Democrats. McClellan campaigned for peace by any means, whether it be reunion or two separate countries. This, this caused a lot of controversy, as expected. Since only a half of his party supporting him, he lost. From the start, he had an only 25% approval rate. And that was not means of winning. After the war, people began to criticize McClellan's contributions more and more. And to escape the public life, George and his family decided to move to Europe. They spent three years touring the continent visiting many different places. After returning from Europe, 
he took several business-related jobs, including serving as three terms as governor of New York. After, after his career in business, he retired to a peaceful and easy life. Soon he began experiencing sharp pains in his heart, and his health slowly deteriorated. On October 29, 1885, George McClellan died. McClellan was second in his class, engineer, brilliant organizer, fought bravely in the Mexican War. It seemed at the time that the Union could have not chosen a better general. But they were wrong. McClellan was, and still is, the worst general of the Civil War. Some may argue against what I have said here. They may say, oh, he wasn't that bad of a guy. He was a good general. He was a smart guy. I say wrong. In my opinion, he was the worst general of the Civil War. And isn't that the only thing that matters? Walking down the street, saying hi to everybody that I meet. Walking down the street, walking down the street, saying hi to everybody that I meet. Left foot, right foot, walking down the street. Walking down the street, walking down the street, saying hi to everybody that I meet. Walking down the street, walking down the street, saying hi to everybody that I meet. Yeah, walking down the street, walking down the street, saying hi to everybody that I meet. Walking, 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 walking down the street. Left foot, right foot, walking down the street.